Greetings in the name of Christ and welcome to St. Philip Presbyterian Church's Wednesday devotional. My name is Reverend Alyssa Connor and I'm one of the pastors here at St. Philip. Today's devotional is about JL and it has a lot of violence in it. So if that's something that you're not wanting to hear, then please feel free to go watch one of our other devotionals. In fact, even the image behind me has quite a bit of violence in it. I'm sitting in front of the worst part and I'll move in just a minute as I read the story of JL. Please listen as I read the word. JL's story takes place in Judges, and I'm going to read the beginning of chapter four. Her story intersects with Deborah's story, and we may come back and read Deborah's story later. But first, let's hear who JL will interact with in the beginning of chapter four. Please listen as I read the word. After Yud had died, the Israelites again did things that the Lord saw as evil. So the Lord gave them over to King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, and he was stationed in Haroseth HaGoim. The Israelites cried out to the Lord because Sisera had 900 iron chariots and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly for 20 years. So the story goes on with the battle between Sisera and others. And then we hear this part about Jael. Meanwhile, Sisera had fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Herber in Canaanite, because there was peace between Hazor's king Jabin and the family of Habar, the Canaanite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, come in, sir, come in here, do not be afraid. So he went with her into her tent and she hid him under a blanket. Sisera said to her, please give me a little water to drink. I'm thirsty. So she opened a jug of milk and gave him drink and hid him again. Then he said to her, stand at the entrance of the tent. That way, if someone comes and asks you, is there a man here? You can say no. But Jael, Herber's wife, picked up a tent stake and a hammer. While Sisera was sound asleep from exhaustion, She tiptoed to him. She drove the stake through his head and down into the ground, and he died. Just then, Barak arrived after chasing Sisera. Jael went out to meet him and said, come, and I'll show you the man you're after. So he went in with her, and there was Sisera laying dead with a stake through his head. So on that day, God brought down Canaan's king, Jabin, before the Israelites, And the power of the Israelites grew greater and greater over Canaan's King Jabin until they defeated him completely. All right, there you have it. Jael's story, much like many other women in the Bible, comes with a bunch of different possible interpretations. We don't get a full picture of all of her motives. And so it's left to us to interpret based on other context clues in the passage, as well as historical information, as well as our own feelings about the passage, what might have actually been going on through JL's mind and in the rest of this story. It is important to note that in Judges 5, she is heralded as most blessed of women, which is only used in scripture other places to describe Mary mother of Jesus. As we go through JL's story, I'm going to highlight a couple of perspectives from different theologians. I'm taking these from Helpmates, Harlots, and Heroes, the second edition, Women's Stories in the Hebrew Bible. And so they kind of walk through and highlight different interpretations, and that's what I'm going to do as well. The first one is one that's done by many different theologians, including Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and the book says many contemporary male commentators concur with Stanton, and that's the perspective that JL is um, deplorable. She Her actions are horrible. She acts against hospitality. She acts in violence. She's deceitful. Um, she does all of these things when Sisera is looking for peace, and so her actions just have no um, positive recourse. They are They are just not great actions. The next interpretation takes a totally different perspective and states, so JL does what many of us would not have the courage to do. She invites a known rapist into her tent, and then without hesitation, using what she has and what she knows, 
with skills and determination, she kills him. Not a nice story, but then the times were not nice. And Cicero was not a nice man. Talking about desert hospitality in the face of this reality is inappropriate. The third interpretation talks more about how Jael is caught in the middle. She's a woman who sees that the Israelites have obviously won. They can't be far behind Sisera. And she knows that while her family has sided with Sisera and that army before, that if she doesn't do something, then they're going to be in big trouble with the Israelites. So her action is more pragmatic, um, that she kills him and that then will save her family. So I'm interested to hear which of the three perspectives you resonate with the most. Is it that her hospitality was horrible, that she was deplorable, that she was deceitful, and she acted outside the realm of what is reasonable in the context of hospitality? Is it that she did what she needed to do um, and killed a man who was a known rapist? Is it that she did what was pragmatic for her family? Which of these three interpretations resonates with you? As we read about JL, it is interesting to see that our own backgrounds can also inform the way that we interpret her story. There's a quote that is listed in Helpmates, Harlots, and Heroes that was really helpful for me, and I hope it will be helpful for you as well. In an article dealing with diverse responses of women to Deborah, JL, and Cicero's mother, Catherine Sackfield concludes with this story. A group of Korean women were expressing some enthusiasm for Jail's exploits, and I commented that most women I knew, white, middle, upper class, North Americans like me, had trouble with this story. I suggested certain roots for our difficulties with the story. We're too accustomed to not having to defend our homeland. Many of us are also influenced by the Christian theme of turning the other cheek. I asked these Koreans what they could offer out of their setting that might be helpful to me. After a brief pause, there came a bold reply from the far end of the table. If you American women would just realize that your place in the story is with Cicero's mother, waiting to collect the spoil of your interventions across the world. I did not want to hear that. I did not want to be reminded of the negative effects of first world colonialism and military might in which I participate by my citizenship. But I have reflected longer about it. I wonder whether I did not hear God's prophet as that woman spoke. That thought and that exchange remain among the most disturbing and the most profound moments of my Asian journey, a time of hearing the Bible as word of God through the voices of those not like myself. How might your background influence the way that you read this story? What have you heard about it in the past? And what new things did you hear about it today? I invite you to reflect this week about those things and let me know what you think about this story. I invite you to pray. Holy God, once again, we ask for your peace and your guidance. We give you thanks for all of the stories of scripture, however difficult they may be. May they continue to guide us in new ways. In your name we pray. Amen.